warm-ups here, but we got to, time to get going. I do have a question in the chat about, and this is relevant to the first slide anyway, so I'm going to take it right now. Is I uh, got an Italian plum three years ago. So far, no sign of flowering. Will pruning help? Likely, pruning is, re is relevant to that. Um, fertilization is also potentially relevant, and then sun exposure. So um, one of the things that happens with fruit trees is if they don't have the right age of wood in the right positions, in other words, if you're pruning too hard uh, in particular, you may not have much flower. Um, flip side on older trees, if you don't prune at all, sometimes that affects flowering as well. Pruning could be part of the problem. If you're getting no flowers at all in three years, it's unlikely to be the entire problem. So I would look into nutrition as well. And with that, we're going to go ahead and move into the main topic. So we're here today to talk about fruit tree pruning. And uh, it's kind of a broad topic, so we're going to try to run through that in today's session. Um, bear in mind that can't cover everything. I can't really get too much into things like small fruits. We will talk a little bit about a couple of the uh, esoteric nut trees and, and, uh, and, and persimmons and such as well. Um, but that doesn't mean I'm not willing to take questions at the end about those topics. They're just not covered in the main part of the presentation. So feel free after we get through this to, uh, to, to chime in with questions that on those regards too, and I'm happy to take those. Um, so welcome all. And uh, we do have an online as well as an in-person class going today. So there are gonna be questions coming both ways. So I'm gonna request all of the online attendees, please stay muted during the main presentation. If you have questions relevant to the slides I'm on at the moment, type them in chat. I am keeping an eye on that. I may not get to them instantly. Um, in room, if you got something question relevant to the slide, I'm immediately on, raise a hand, I'm gonna take your question. Other than that, major questions or, or side questions or questions that are tangential, we'll save them to the end for people online. You can at that point uh, unmute if you'd like and ask questions verbally or use the chat, whatever you're comfortable with. <laughs> so today we're talking about fruit tree pruning. And why would we do this? You have a tree, it's growing. We want it to grow. So why are we taking growth off? Well, fruit trees were intensively bred and usually now grafted for some specific characteristics, including a yield and fruit quality and presentation. Um, that has left them in many regards with some deficiencies in terms of things like pest and disease resistance, which we're gonna be uh, one of the things we'll be addressing. Also, because you're trying to manage these trees, this is not a tree out in the forest, you're trying to spray them, harvest them, do all those kinds of good things with them. We would like to have some degree of control of the overall size and shape to make that more manageable. Trees that have been commercially selected and grafted in particular tend to be intensively overproductive as they mature to the detriment of fruit quality and sometimes to the detriment of tree health. So we want to prune appropriately to encourage good fruit, fruit productivity, but with good quality and find, maintaining that balance. And lastly, particularly with uh, older trees, trees age, just like all of us. And as those trees get bigger and older, they start losing vigor. They, they stop putting on so much new growth every year uh, in, in desirable ways. And that's a problem because that growth that comes out one year becomes next year's fruit and flower buds and so if it's not putting a lot of that out, you've got a diminishing potential for yield. So these are all the things we're trying to accomplish in the course of pruning our trees. There's some timing issues and these are tendencies. These are not necessarily written in stone. Generally speaking, in our relatively moderate climate here in the Pacific Northwest, we prune during the dormant season. That means now. But we want to make sure that we're late enough in that dormant season. In other words, when the leaves fall in October, the tree is not fully dormant yet. There's still some sap flow. There's still some potential for injury or renewed growth if you prune. So we like to have a couple of frosty nights uh, and, and have plenty of longer period of colder weather and shorter days to make sure that tree is really fully dormant before we start taking pruners and saws to it. So. Usually this is after a good freeze or two is 
um, early December, maybe the very end of November, never before Thanksgiving. You know, that's that's really pushing the, the envelope for dormancy in this area. The other end of the trade-off is, for the most part, we want to do most of our pruning before bud development in the spring. This is to reduce, again, damage on the tree when the sap is up and flowing. You're more likely to cause injury. Also, as those buds develop in the late winter going into early spring, they tend to be more susceptible to being damaged or broken off just from a bud standpoint, and that can cost you some yield. So that gives us a rough pruning window that starts in maybe early December or maybe late November at the very earliest and runs clear up basically through February on most fruit trees. Um, so a fairly wide window to, to work with. Now, there are other times to prune, and in some climates, summer pruning is the rule rather than the exception. So we will often do follow-up pruning in the summer because trees react to your pruning. So when you take wood off of a tree, the tree dramatically wants to replace all of that wood you're in. It put it on for a reason. So when the hormone balance is focused on vegetative growth, which is what happens after the flowers grow out, right? So flowers are stored energy. The tree wants to grow as soon as those flowers have finished getting pollinated and started to develop fruit. Um, that, that tree is primed to put on lots of vegetative growth. So it does. On the other hand, in midsummer or so, usually about June here is what I look at, um, the hormone balance that tree has shifted. It's very focused on ripening what fruit it has set. Follow-up pruning done in June does not tend to promote as vigorous a new growth response. And particularly with trees that are older and have lots of growth after you prune them, or trees like plums that, that fill in badly, or pears that send a lot of very vertical growth, Summer pruning as an additional pruning in the growing season can be beneficial to reducing how much you have to do the following year. You get into a pattern of that, you're taking off less every winter, you have less growth response in the spring, and then you do the light follow-up pruning and you become this feedback loop that is reducing your work rather than increasing your work. So why don't we just prune in, in, in June? You can. Um, there does tend to be a tendency to overproduce fruit really heavily if you're not pruning them um, in the dormant season or removing some flower, flower buds. Um, also, the tree is substantially more delicate in that season. You, you're putting a ladder up against the tree branch or you're standing in the crotch of the tree. In the winter, you can get away with that pretty readily. In the spring and summer, yeah, we get a little more leery about doing that. Lastly, it's really, really, really hard to see what you're doing with all the full leaf canopy out. So it's much harder to evaluate um, how your progress is going on this pruning job. Um, but both of those seasons are relevant for pruning. Of course, we focus heavily on the dormant season pruning because that's most of what we do here. Weather impacts your ability to prune. Generally speaking, we would like to avoid pruning when it's sopping wet, not just from a standpoint of your comfort level, but because those fresh cuts uh, in very wet conditions are more likely to get infected before they heal than if we have at least a brief period of drying down for them to kind of seal up. We generally don't like to prune when the weather is below freezing, though a bare frost is not gonna impact your, your prunability at all. There are cautions though. If we get temperatures down in the very low teens or upper single, single digits, you shouldn't be pruning in that window of time, even if your daytime temperatures are elevated. Um, pay attention to your forecasts. When you get these Arctic blasts coming through where temperatures could potentially be that cold, you don't want to be pruning within three or four days ahead of that, because again, you're likely to have additional damage on those fresh cuts that haven't completely healed yet. That's a pretty scarce concern in the Willamette Valley. It does happen, so be aware of it. So some basic tools. Um, obviously, you need a relevant fruit tree. If you don't have one, we'd be happy to help you. Um, as fruit and nut trees are great production trees. It does take a while to get into production, but uh, they are kind of essential to the topic at hand. You'll need some form of pruning device, hand pruners for smaller cuts. A typical pair of hand pruners would be a cicator like this. This is a bypass pruner. Blade goes past the anvil, promotes very good cuts. 
you're likely an older tree to also need a saw. Um, so saws, when we get beyond about two inches in diameter, um, you're not gonna do that with, with pruners or bigger pruners like lockers. You're gonna need to cut, to cut with a saw. Um, trees that are three years old, four years old, you're getting up into that age where that's likely to be relevant. We strongly recommend you use gloves. It's cold out there in the winter, you're doing the pruning. In addition, you're handling a lot of broken stubs of branches and sharp implements, so protecting your hands is, is well worthwhile. Uh, young trees, this is not so essential, and maybe if you prune some of the dwarf forms hard enough, you can get away without it, but for the most part, you're going to need a lacquer. You need to be actually up in the branch canopy to do some selective cutting. There are ways around that. Um, for example, on my site, which is a very soppy clay soil, and my, my trees are planted on a bit of a mound, um, more, more often than not, rather than trying to get a ladder to stand up in that and not just sink, um, I have a, an extension lopper, a very long pole pruner. Uh, that I can reach about 10, 15 feet with. Uh, it gives me the ability to, to prune higher without, without having to settle back. Hard on the upper body, though. That's, that's pretty, pretty, pretty brutal. Rain gear, because this is Western Oregon, and you are likely to be getting wet even if it's not raining while you're doing it. The trees accumulate a fair amount of moisture, even from dew accumulation along the branches, and the moss on the branches, and it's kind of a wet job. Um, I hate rain gear, so I don't ever do that. So just, it's an advisory. Um, you need to maintain your tools a bit. Keeping a good sharp blade on your pruners and, and a slightly less sharp, but very well angled uh, cutting edge on your loppers um, goes a long way to promoting wound healing on the trees. Saws often require specialty sharpening. So you may need to hire that done. Fortunately, you seldom, you don't have to sharpen your saws anywhere near as often as you do your pruners. You don't make as many cuts with them. You should sanitize your cutting implements. And the level of sanitation you're going to play with on these really depends on what you're running into up there. If you have a tree with a known established disease problem, with lots of scab or bulls that rot on an apple or some bacterial blight on a cherry or plum, you might consider actually wiping down and sterilizing your pruners between every cut, okay? It's because a lot of these diseases can spread from the blade, from sap on the blade to the next cut. On the other hand, a tree that's visibly in good health, you're not having a lot of problems with, I just like to see you sterilize your pruners as you move from tree to tree, just to avoid risking moving a pathogen along. Sanitation can be a couple of different methods. Rubbing alcohol is convenient for me. I usually have some in the, in the cabinet at home. I can put a little bit on a rag and wipe down the cutting surfaces very easily. Bleach water solutions, particularly if you get into larger volumes of pruning, I just have a few fruit trees to manage, might be worthwhile. Um, a one part bleach and nine parts water does a fine job of sanitizing blades. And uh, you're just keeping them clean to reduce the, uh, the spread of diseases. Last tool you need is courage. <laughs> this looks like you're butchering your tree. You're not, as long as you're doing it advisedly and understand what you're trying to accomplish with it. But you do have to take your take your 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 uh, your your courage in hand and and get into it and do it. So books um, and. For those at home, you can look this up online. You can shop on our online store for it as well. Pruning Made Easy, Lewis Hill. And I'm going to just hand out a couple of copies for you. You want to kind of look around to, to see what's offered there. It is a great book, and it is not exclusively about uh, fruit tree pruning. It covers all aspects of pruning, some small fruit stuff, um, ornamentals, vines. Uh, huge reference was one of the top 75 gardening books by American Horticultural Society, one of those movies. Um, just a solid reference and covers most aspects of pruning very, very well. Uh, and so as we're going through the uh, the presentation of the folks at home don't need to, to feel left out, I've got pictures in the, in the slides from the book so you can kind of see the, the key points we're looking at about this particular topic. Okay, a few nomenclature and biology notes or botany notes here. Basic structure of a tree. So you have a tree, you have a crown. The crown is the point where the root system intersects the trunk. 
The crown is slightly below soil to slightly above soil. It's that transition zone. You have a root system. That root system is much, much, much larger than you think in terms of extensiveness. If you look at a, a semi-dwarf fruit tree with an estimated maturity around 15 feet, it's probably got roots 20 to 25 feet in all directions from the trunk at maturity. The big roots, okay? Mm -hmm. So bear in mind, you want to avoid injuring those roots when you're doing other tasks in the yard and garden. Relevant to today's talk, you have a trunk from the crown, the main part of the structure, the weight-bearing structure of the tree that comes up is the trunk. Usually in most fruit trees, that is a single trunk. Trees that have been damaged and regrown, that may not be. Um, some trees, for example, figs, usually are grown multi-trunk instead of single trunk. So some variation on there, but there's always a load-bearing structure. From that trunk, you have and will develop on a young tree and maintain on an older tree, scaffold branches. Now, scaffold branches are the skeletal structure of your, uh, of your tree. So you think of the trunk as your spinal column, and you can think of the scaffold branches as your arms and legs. And these are what support all the functional parts on the outer end. Usually, we're trying to maintain something like three or four or five scaffold branches roughly symmetrically arrayed around the main trunk so that we don't off balance too far to one side. Now from those scaffold branches, you have all the secondary growth, the lateral development that come off of those scaffold branches. So scaffold branches are your arms and lateral growth are your fingers. And this is where the flowering and fruit production and, great, and a great proportion of the, uh, of the vegetal growth, the leaf growth uh, comes out. So those are the parts we'll be discussing specifically within pruning context. And uh, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about those points. So technique matters, making good cuts. It is an important point to understand a branch collar. Um, and you can kind of see it uh, in the branch here. I'll show you online as well. We have a main branch right here. We have a lateral branch coming off here. This swollen differentiated tissue where they join is a branch collar. You can see it, the main branch here, lateral branch here. And you can see the physical swelling of the tissue that comes off of that main branch that supports that lateral branch coming out. That branch collar is a differentiated specialty tissue. It heals really, really fast. It's designed to help protect the tree as well as support the weight of the branches. So when we are pruning, we try to avoid cutting into the branch collar. We cut branches flush to the branch collar out here, not flush to the main branch in here. And then they heal better with less damage to the interior. A couple of types of cuts will be happening in the course of pruning. A thinning cut, is simply removing an entire branch back to its parent branch or to the main trunk. <clears throat> so if we're looking at our sample here, if we were to take this branch all the way back at the branch collar, that's a thinning cut. We are removing one entire section. If we took this, parent, this branch back at its parent branch, that would also be a thinning cut. A heading cut is when you are cutting less than the entire length of a given branch. And trees respond somewhat differently to thinning cuts versus heading cuts. When you make a heading cut, if we were to cut this branch right here above this, this growing point, suddenly this bud and this kind of dormant bud, bud here and this bud here are gonna get a huge amount of the energy that comes up from that branch. And they're gonna grow dramatically more aggressively. So the cut here, these two would become very, very dominant branches. When you do a thinning cut, we remove this branch here, the energy disperses and diffuses up that. You still get a growth response, but it's less directed and dramatic than with a, with a, with a heading cut. So proper technique, as we talked about, thinning a branch, parent branch, got a secondary, got a branch collar, we're gonna cut just flush to the branch collar. Same thing, got a main branch and a lateral branch. Branch collar is right here. We're gonna cut just flush to the branch collar, not to the parent branch. 
This enables good healing and will encourage overall uh, branch health. <clears throat> For a heading cut, we are intentionally trying to save and direct some growth right at that point. So it's important that we don't risk losing that point we're trying to encourage, which means we're not going to come all the way down flush. Um, we want to have a little bit of room for that tree to respond and maybe die off a little bit around that cut. It happens. With a heading cut, it's important to make a slanted cut rather than a broad cross cut. A uh, slanting cut will give an ability for the tree to do a little bit of dieback on the far tip and less and less as you get back to the base of the cut, thus preserving more of the branch tissue. So angle cut, 45 degree is an ideal angle. You don't need to get your protractor out there. Be in the ballpark is fine. Really, really long cuts tend to have more length of dieback or stubbing. Really, really short cuts tend to have a broader circumference of, of dying. So we want a slanted cut. We want the long part of our slant to be towards the branch we're trying to promote and grow. We want the back side of the cut approximately a quarter inch or so above the op opposition point of that same growing point. So we're making a slanted cut, leaving a stub like that. That enables us to have a little bit of dieback right here without affecting that. Should do the same thing here with the group in in home. So we got our branch here. We're going to head back to this. We're going to make our slanted cut roughly 45 degrees and about a quarter inch uh, above the opposition point to that growth, to that growing point we're, we're promoting. So you can see there, you know, go like that. You can see we've left ourselves a little stub with a back slant. There's likely even with well-maintained, sharpened and cleaned and adjusted pruners to have a little bit of tearing. That's the other reason we wanna be careful about not getting too close. Get some tissue damage along that cut and give it a chance to heal. Saw cutting is a little different. I didn't have a big branch to demonstrate with, so we're just gonna talk through it. So you can do lopper cuts up to, or hand, hand printer cuts up to maybe three quarters of an inch or an inch in, in branch diameter your hands are strong. Inch and a half-ish, maybe inch and three quarters, two-hand lopper pruners do a fine job without doing too much trauma to the tree, and they're manageable, at least with a good pair of loppers. But anything beyond two inches is the realm of saws. Now, when you're talking a branch that size, you want to keep in mind that there is a lot of weight out here. Okay, so that branch is coming up and going this way, and you're cutting it here, and there's six or eight or 10 feet of branch development out this way, 80, 100 pounds of branches potentially on a really big tree going like a five or six inch branch. So you've got to make sure that you're not tearing that cut because the moment you start cutting down through the branch, you can get a third of the way through or so, and that's going to, the weight is just going to crack that out and that branch will break and you will peel a big strip of bark and can be several feet of peeled off bark, very damaging to the tree. So you want to pick your point you're going to be cutting that tree branch back to, and you want to undercut it, right? So you want to take your saw upside down and back cut on the underside at the point you want that cut to be. Now you're gonna come an inch or two past that away from the tree towards the branch you want to actually fall off. Now you're going to make your downward cut. And now as that weight in that tree starts bending on that cut, bending on the cut, it's going to still splinter back, but it's going to splinter back to that undercut and drop off clean with minimal splintering. Now you've got a little bit of a stub here with no weight. You can line up your cuts and cut down to match up your undercut. This will give you a finished clean cut with minimal to no tearing, um, and that's very, very important. So technique matters, and it's all about promoting good healing and maintaining the tree health. Now we're gonna talk about how we get there on a the tree. What, what are we looking for? I like to take a kind of a three rule approach to pruning. Approach the tree, get up in the tree, 
look for dead, broken, damaged, or obviously infected or insect infested branches. Take those off first. Get down out of the tree. Walk around the tree, take a look. Do we have branches that are actually in contact still, they're rubbing? Do we have branches from this side of the tree that are angling back into the interior of the tree where they're just gonna be in everybody else's way? That's a good candidate for next stage of removal. Final stage then is, okay, we've taken care of the problems. Now let's develop the aesthetic and productivity of the tree. And this is where we start pruning for shape and for openness, because even after all that, you've still got a hundred water sprouts going vertically straight up. So how does that play out? Okay, so dead, damaged, diseased tissue. Here's some examples from my poor peach tree in my swamp. You know, peach trees really don't like that environment very well. Um, we have examples of some dead, dead tips. The left picture there, the, 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 the central horizontal branch there is completely dead. You can tell by the discoloration that needs to be removed. Um, in the center picture, there's a canker there, um, whether that's a physiological canker from a previous branch rubbing or injury, more likely that's a bacterial canker, that's an elongate canker from a bacterial infection. That needs to be pruned out. That's a weak spot and potential source of infection on the tree, within, even if it isn't a primary pathogen at that point. Picture on the right has lilac bacterial blight expressed on cherry tree, one of the biggest problems we have with cherries here. And you'll see all that sap oozing out of that, that juncture of those branches. That needs to be pruned out as clean as you can make it. With a tree like this, I'd be sterilizing between every cut. We have obvious notable bacterial problems going on. It's a risk with peach trees. Even though I do this for a living, I have problems with some of these things too. What we're looking for aesthetically is a form that will support production both weight-wise and volumetrically. There's a batch of different ways you can get there. Different regions often have different preferences. And to some extent, you'll see some differences from tree to tree in what they'll handle. The central leader promotes a tree with a fairly substantial height. It enables you to squeeze more production in per square foot, perhaps, but it's a harder tree to work with in the home garden without, without me mechanized equipment to get up into it. Modified leader is, is a very common approach in orchards where you're trying to tr truly maximize your yield per tree planted. It's still a bit on the high side and there's some definite um, trade-offs in terms of the, uh, the uh, ripening sequence. The fruit is fairly well dispersed through the tree and not all of it's getting equal amounts of light. In general, in the home garden, we recommend an open centered style of pruning. And I like to visualize an open centered tree like this. If you uh, walk in front of your tree and you're standing and you're looking at the trunk and you look up, you should be seeing sky, not branches. Visualize a donut. All your branch growth is around the perimeter of the tree, not straight up in the center. So examples in process. Very, very, very old apple tree. I would hesitate to even guess how old that thing is, but it's ancient. That has actually been maintained over the years. This is probably two years worth of growth showing on that. So two, two maybe at most three years of, of not being pruned, being brought back in. So not bad by, from a neglect standpoint at all. So you notice all of those very vertical things in the middle. So very vertical growths like that are water sprouts is what they call them. And they're a vegetative growth response. They tend to not produce flowers and fruit until they get big enough to send out substantial amounts of lateral off of them. And that, then they can sometimes transition out to production branches. What they do do is they produce a lot of leaves. They produce a very dense shade canopy wherever those branches are going up. Um, so they need to come out. And so as you can see, it looks like we just took a ton and ton of, of leaf mass off of that tree when we pruned out those centers. But this is a good example of an open centered form tree uh, where you could actually see up through the middle and your branch development is going out all along the perimeter or outside edges of the branches. So getting there, starting from a young tree. Um, this is be a, uh, like a two year old bare root tree in the picture here. And generally what we're trying to do is start the process. A couple of things you want to keep in mind here. 
you've got your bare root, you plant that in the ground, you've got your trunk mass coming up, and you've got some lateral branches that have begun on this. It's a two-year-old or possibly even three-year-old tree, so a little bit of lateral branches off that main trunk, but not much. Your goal here is to get to the point where you have those three to four to five major scaffold branches. But those branches you're seeing on there are never going to get any higher off the ground than they are right now. The tree doesn't grow internodal here. The tree grows all out the tips. So first thing you need to do when you're looking at a young fruit tree is decide, these low branches, are these candidates for scaffold branches? or do we need to get them out now? They are the lowest branches, they're the older branches, they are likely to get a lot of the energy coming up from the main trunk, and they can get bigger and bigger over time if they're not removed soon. Then it becomes a much more challenging job correcting that without a bit leaving a big wound. So first priority, decide if the branches you have are suitable. Next, we're gonna start actually making the selections of those scaffold branches. And the criteria here is branches that are well angled. Now on an apple tree, that's seldom a huge issue. Occasionally you'll see some that are really flat. That's not a good angle. Very occasionally you'll see some really tight angles. On a pear tree, they're almost all like this, very strongly vertical angles. Those are not great choices. You want to select for branches that are at least approaching a 45 degree angle because a really tight branch has a very long area of attachment. And that attachment wood is much weaker than either the trunk wood or the, or the lateral wood. And when you get a good ice storm or a heavy fruit load on those, they'll just peel right off the tree. Conversely, a very flat uh, branch angle has very little spring and support. And it's also likely to get snapped, either medial snapped or snapped at the, at the juncture from weight load. 45 degree angle works like a bow. You've got, a, you've got your weight out here on the ends and it's bowing and you've got this kind of spring effect going on the branch angle itself. And that tends to reduce the overall pressures on the branches. You also want to select branches that are um, basically evenly spaced around the perimeter. So you don't want all your scaffold branches coming out this way. You want some here and some here and some there uh, to distribute the weight evenly around the tree. Um, ideally, those finished scaffold branches you select should not all be coming at exactly the same point off the trunk. It's ideal to have branches that have even a, just a minimal degree of separation, just a few inches is fine, uh, rather than all at one spot. Because when we get done with developing our scaffold and we take the top out of the tree, that's, you got to have a, a healable cut and you don't want, again, all the weight coming down and, and dispersing along a weak spot split. So trying to, generally speaking, promote good strength in the, in the scaffold structure. This may not happen in a first year of pruning because I don't want you to take more than maybe 25 to 30% of the available leaf mass off of that tree at any one pruning. So priority obviously still damaged broken branches. Next, low branches, are they keepable? Do we have viable scaffold branches that we're gonna start developing? Often enough, first year is one and two, sure. Third, maybe not so much. So if we don't have the scaffold branches we want, where we want them, we need to encourage the tree to develop ones that can become scaffold branches. That's the point at which we will consider actually topping the leader. So if you look at a young tree, you've got a trunk coming up, you got branches arrayed around, but you've got one branch that is mostly in line with the trunk. Um, sometimes there's some variation in that, but generically speaking, mostly in line with the trunk. And it will be the highest, most robust branch on the tree. That's the leader. Energy is focused on going up that way. It will continue to push out top growth out of that at the expense of developing growth along that. So if we're trying to develop new branches to have selections, for, uh, for, for laterals for, for, uh, or for uh, scaffolds, we need to top that. You don't need to get way, way carried away. You take off a third of that, that's plenty to take off. After you've done that, take a very close look at what you have remaining for branches. 
because you take a third, a quarter, or a third off that leader, you may have another branch that's almost a leader, it's very close in competition, and now you've taken that tip off. Now it's co-equal or maybe even taller than what you've left behind on the leader. The tree will divert energy out that way and grow a, a curved leader out that way instead. So you may need to bring any secondaries back proportionally to maintain a still dominant leader while allowing for some lateral growth out here to pick from. So this is usually about years roughly one through three are selecting and developing a decent scaffold. Um, and that's what we're shooting for in, in the initial growth. Uh, Chris Chenard's quote down there in the bottom, you cut off half my tree, Ronaldo the Butcher. No, I only cut off a third. A third is safe on a young tree. On the older trees, be a little more cautious sometimes, but a third is, is safe on a young tree. We go for 25 to 30% is a good safe margin for, for branch removal. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Question about that. <laughs> yes. Okay, so where those cuts are, mm -hmm. um, won't won't the tree when you make that cut, like say the one on the left, <clears throat> will it it won't continue further? It'll split right here right. or go back to the next slide. Right. So those are those you likely you're gonna get some 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 branches open here. So two things about this photo. If those are too low, you will be removing them closer to the trunk. If those are your selection scaffold branches, we will often, if we have not hit our 25% or 30% load will tip them back because they'll get thicker quicker, even if they, even though it means they're gonna branch some. And when we're doing that, we're, we're clipping them back to an upward bud. So they're going out like this, upward and outward buds. So you head them back here, and now you get your growth coming off that way on a new vigorous growth from that. But that's only if you have enough room left in your pruning budget for that tree for this season. And so you can see that happening as you progress on the same tree from here. So year two, we're doing some thinning out of secondary branches in the interior, promoting that broadly spreading habit. We're also heading back to keep, so we don't have our scaffold branches be these long thin branches. So they actually develop some girth and some recurve to them. Um, you can really see that, I think I've got another picture. We can really see that development on the, on this on this tree on the right here, where they've been headed and regrown and headed and regrown. The same process is happening in, in the early stages of scaffold development. So we're developing some girth as well. By year three, we're really starting to focus on uh, on on selecting that uh, that donut shape, but we haven't completely centered out yet. Um, so we're both heading back the extremes. The, the branches, the lateral branches we're going to keep that aren't, but are not, uh, but are getting outside the perimeter of what we want. Um, but we're also thinning back secondary branches pretty heavily. And by year four, we're looking at maintaining. This is a modified leader prune you see here. So we did not actually take the tip all the way back. We just created a kind of a multiple head structure out of it instead. Uh, but a really good illustration of, of the general pruning of a young tree to get it up into production age. Then it starts getting a little more extensive. So apple trees are easy. If you want to learn pruning, learn on an apple tree because they really cooperate pretty well. Yes, they regrow, but they're, they're not complicated. Plum trees are a nightmare to prune mm -hmm. uh, because they put on lots and lots of thin spindly growth and it congests and it goes every which way uh, off the branches. Um, so it's really hard to get a good good uh, structure. So you can see that third year on that growth on, on the left picture there, uh, just a mess of branches, a thicket of branches. And after pruning, we've headed the, the keeper branches in, but we've thinned out a lot of that interior, including removing all the vertical stuff to open out that center. Um, and this is getting into production age on a plum three years. So you should start to be seeing some, some flower and fruit development normally. Uh, peach trees. Now, this is my peach tree in my swamp. You can see how wet that is, why I have trouble pruning that sometimes, and why the peach doesn't really quite thrive there. Um, there's a couple of schools of thought on peach trees. This is a peach on a semi-dwarf rootstock, and I intentionally want a little more height out of it for, for neighbor control, as it were, you know, visual, visual field control. Uh, so ornamental as well as well as production. So I have actually limbed it up in the in the initial stages and branched it high. 
Look at a peach orchard. They put, a, they put a baby peach tree in the ground and they cut it in half. They'll stub it like, like 28 inches off the ground and make it start branching clear down there. Peaches tend to ripen fast on the upper outside section of the tree. And they really wanna be able to reach those without having to climb ladders all the time to get them. Peaches also need quite a bit of spraying. So the, the commercially, they'll often much, develop a much shorter tree than this. So there are options. These are, these are some guidelines, but th this is not an absolute do it this way. There's a lot of right ways to do it and a few really wrong ways to do it. So you can see what that looks like at a three-year-old uh, peach tree with, with lots of lateral growth. This is in production age. I had peaches off that tree that year. Um, now we've got to finish opening out the center. As you can see, I did there, took, a, took the main lead out completely developing that donut shape on the scaffold branches and thinning those laterals to a sustainable amount so that we have good angles on them and the potential for productivity out that are not completely overlapping each other. Again, an older tree with an open center. Uh, dwarf and semi-dwarf, I really like this style for pruning. It's a little harder to achieve on a pear, um, really easy on, on an apple. And this gives you a really short stocky tree. This is um, peaches and nectarines, if you print them like this too, and it really is a great way to handle it. You bring them down low and, and open them out. Um, anything to re re reduce the height and promote accessibility. So there are some exceptions. We talk about fruit trees broadly. Figs are really, really different. So figs ideally in the home garden ought to be stumped grow three or four or six branches from ground level, they are not grafted. They're all one type all the way up. Now you have uh, this, if it was a eucalyptus, they call it a mallee, this, this thickety shrubby tree. And it brings the size of this fig tree down to something around 12 feet, maybe 15 feet at the most, instead of 25 or 30 feet like big fig trees can get. So, Fig trees that are successful in the Pacific Northwest typically are ever-bearing figs with a breva production pattern. It means you get uh, baby fruit that are set on at the ends of the branches in the, in the late summer to fall, and those baby fruits sit there on the branches through the winter. As the new growth develops out in the spring and early summer, those figs swell and ripen as an early summer crop. We get that crop pretty reliably. Then ever-bearing figs will also put on a second crop on newer growth in the late summer. We don't always have enough heat and summer to ripen that crop. So we do focus on um, preserving the Breva crop heavily and on working with, crop with figs that have that Breva crop potential. So the one-year-old growth, last season's growth, is where your figs will be produced. Older wood doesn't produce figs, Current year's growth, except on the late season crop, doesn't produce figs. This is all, and there has to be the new growth off of one year wood for the, for the late, crop, late crop too. So what we're trying to do here is open out the center of that fig. We're not trying to really develop a per se a scaffold and branch structure, just opening out the center and then thinning the amount of one year old growth to a sustainable volume. And that may mean taking off a third of the one-year-old growth uh, or a quarter of the one-year-old growth. So you don't have so many tiny figs, you have a slightly fewer number of much larger, more developed figs. But the key thing on figs is to, is to thin them much more aggressively. When you start getting to a point where you've got old branches that don't have a lot of one-year growth on them anymore, you can head them back and re-sprout from down low and develop a whole new multi-trunk structure. And that's a good, good choice on figs. Persimmons are different. Generally speaking, persimmons, if you think of a persimmon as, instead of being a traditional scaffold, it's more like kind of lateral multiple heads or leaders. Um, you want to bring them back and thin them out. You need to head those branches back periodically or they stop producing. So, um, open them out first and your scaffold branches with laterals on them, head back year over year, kind of on a rotation basis around the tree, very effective. Alternatively, you can prune them all in, just don't bring them back hard. Keep a fair amount of scaffold branch developing lateral growth by heading those scaffolds. 
Nut trees are even more like that. Uh, hazelnut and walnut really are multiple heads, not lateral branches. So what this means is that after about four to five years, that, that, that head is no longer capable of flowering and fruiting. You won't get production anymore. So you have to head it back to promote new growth, to renew your production. Commercially, you've got a couple of choices when they're doing that. Um, if you've got a hazelnut orchard, you can go through and do every third row and head them back. So you have hazelnuts constantly in production. Or you can go through and prune um, a third of every tree, head back a third of every tree, which can be pretty stressful in the orchard, but it's pretty effective. A lot of, a lot of, you see a lot of that done commercially. So you just have to keep track year over year of where you're at on a given batch of trees, working your way around the heads. A real common approach on hazelnuts is to head everything. You have no crop the following year, but your extremely heavy crops the next two years after that commercially more than make up for it. So for the home garden, you're gonna to have to decide what of that fits your production needs. You may not need hazelnuts every year, walnuts every year. I mean, uh, we, <laughs> we picked, I don't know how many pounds of walnuts this year, and that's probably a three-year supply. We could head those trees back, uh, that, tree, that tree back, and have plenty of, of walnuts when we need them again. Uh, but if you only have three hazelnut trees and you do, do a lot with them, it's definitely worthwhile to take a staggered approach to head removal. So those are your primary, primary differences. Some other exceptions to the rule. Multi-variety combination trees. So what you have there is you've got a rootstock. Sometimes that rootstock is the central top variety as well. Sometimes not, it depends on the tree. And then you've got four or five different varieties grafted on. You can do it yourself at home or you can buy them commercially prepared like that. And they do this to have diversity of production in a small space and to meet pollination requirements. A great number of fruit trees require two or more different tree, trees of the same type and two or more different cherries, for example, to produce fruit. So what happens when they're young, it's really easy. You've got labels on each branch, ideally. Um, keep track pretty, pretty easily about what you're doing. But you get five or six or seven years into that tree, and now it's no longer clear where one variety ends and the other begins within that, within that structure. And the risk is that you, you over prune uh, on a given area, you could completely eliminate an entire variety off of that graft. So with that in mind, um, a good approach is to take the time during production season on these older trees, because they'll be producing, and label the branches. So you have some idea on what's what out there. So a simple surveyor flagging works pretty well. Um, then you know what you're dealing with, and when you get out there in the winter, it's obvious now, oh yeah, those were all the same variety. You don't even have to care necessarily which variety they were unless that matters to you. Just knowing that there are the different varieties and you're preserving them is the criteria there. Um, worth noting that on multi-variety combos, almost inevitably one variety is significantly more aggressive and developing than any of the other varieties on the graph. And you have to fight it and fight it and fight it during the early stages to get any kind of symmetry or balance to your tree. There's no good answer to that problem. It's an ongoing difficulty you have to deal with for four or five years until you've got enough robustness that they have, they, they're more balanced out. Espalier trees need to be handled a bit differently. Yes, we still dormant prune them. Yes, some of the same basic criteria uh, apply. So, with a spalier tree, you've got your main trunk, and then you've got your branches that are physically trained laterally and low on some sort of support structure, wall, fence, wire trellis, or, or the like. And what you don't want to do on them is massively, massively dormant prune. Do your dormant pruning as necessary for health and for controlling any substantial deformities, branches that are way out of the bounds of what you want to grow it in. But espalier trees need some ongoing pruning throughout the growing season, or they either develop asymmetrically badly, or they overshadow out and don't fruit well. Now, some plants are definitely easier to espalier than others in fruit production, and apples and pears espalier really, really readily. 
Stone fruits are a little harder to balance the needs of a spalier with the developing of the spurs they need for fruit production. And sometimes that doesn't go so well. So um, it's not impossible to do, it's just more challenging to do. But the um, key thing on an espalier is to plan your, on a young espalier is to plan your structure so you've got at least three or four feet between layers for your primary support structure. That gives you some room to develop. And to don't envision these like a vine where you're training them out and they're just going to stay in there. They're going to develop out into these broadly half dome shaped or somewhat cylindrical growing areas along each arm of that. So allow enough space for that and prune to encourage that. But um, as you can see in this espalier Asian pair, the challenge is sure, you've got the structure built and you've got the basic layering going on there. You've got fruit on the tree, but you've got all these verticals coming up out of that. And so you go through in June and you take those back and you get some more because they, they're gonna try to re replace that tissue even though they're not as aggressive about it. So you're likely to have to do two or three active season prunings uh, on an espalier to maintain the overall structure and shape you're going to want uh, for that. So we talked about developing trees. We get this question probably more than we get anything else about fruit trees. Bought a house, got a tree, no idea how old it is, no idea what variety it is, some sort of apple. It's a mess, right? So. This is a multi-year process. Now, apple trees, pear trees uh, in particular can live a very long time. Cherry trees, plum trees, maybe not as much, but also quite long lived. I would not immediately give up on having an old overgrown tree. It's well worth salvaging if you can, but I would take a long, hard look at a tree before I decided to spend three to four years getting it back into production. Because in three to four years, you can have a brand new tree in production if, you, if you're working at it. So first off, overall evaluate the tree's health and structural integrity. And it's well and good if you've got uh, a tree that's basically sound but cluttered and has a few broken branches, maybe a few dead branches. But if you, any of your main scaffold branches or the central trunk itself is, is rotting or is severely injured, this may not be a candidate to, 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 uh, to work with. You may just be ahead to just take it out. Aside from those characteristics, however, I would say mostly worth, worth salvaging. So first thing, get up into that tree, evaluate broken, dead, damaged branches. You find that older trees have a lot of loose bark. You need to maybe knock that off and see what's happening under there. It can be just a bark layer with the inner bark still intact, but it can also be a sign of a really serious problem, physical injury, infestation, bad, 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 uh, bad workout with, uh, with sap suckers having, having basically girdled that separate section of branch, that kind of thing. So evaluate that. Next step, removal of severely broken and dead and damaged leaves or branches. That may be all you accomplish in your first year, dead wood removal. Now you have something you can work with and you've got new growth coming out. Also within that first year, however, do take the time to remove any basal suckers. So we talk about a water sprout being a growth coming out of the scaffold branches and going vertically. A sucker is a water sprout but growing out of the root stock graft or very low trunk. Uh, usually from below the graft line, though not always, um, often even from shoulder roots popping up a little bit. All of those are not capable of producing. If from the rootstock, they won't produce anything worthwhile anyway. And they're taking needed energy out of the tree and putting it into vegetative growth in, in a place you don't need. So always prioritize sucker removal within this first stage. Clean up, make sure you don't have, you have workable space under there. Next year, you're going to start actually trying to open that out. And this might be year two or year two and three, um, where we're going to remove, yeah, sorry, I got a question. Mm -hmm. When you're cutting the water root suckers, yes. angle cut, straight, straight cut. cut on, so on suckers, straight cut on the suckers as close to the basal area as you can. They do technically have a collar, but it's not pronounced. It's usually under the bark layer, so you're not going to make a nice clean, clean cut. There's no way to really inherently stop a tree from suckering. Some are more prone to it than others. Uh, it's inherent in the varieties. Grafted trees have a bit of a tendency to sucker. Every time you prune or physically injure the top of a tree, you're likely to get additional sucker growth. So this is an ongoing thing in fruit trees anyway. 
but you'll notice in old neglected orchards, it happens a lot and they might be very, very large. These could very well be saw removal on suckers, on the, the two, two inches or more in diameter. Yeah, they get very big. Um, so your st next step is to, is to start developing that upper canopy. Uh, try to look at the presentation of the bigger, older limbs and maybe get one or two of those out completely out of the, if they're coming into the center. Um, congruent with that, you want to go ahead and take out water sprouting at this point and start actually developing the canopy. Um, not more than a third of the tree. Now, I say that advisedly because there's another school of thought to this. You got a severely overgrown tree and immediate production is not as important as maybe getting it under control. You can pull out a tree. It is not the preferred method of controlling the shape and size of a tree. Bullarding is simply you leave a trunk and your scaffold branches, three or four good scaffold branches, and you just saw them to stubs and you regrow the entire tree. It's really hard on the tree. You can lose a tree from doing that. You can create some serious structural problems by pollarding, but it's quick and dirty and it gives you the chance to start over and you will have two years of just disastrous regrowth that you're trying to fix. But it, it, in, 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 a, in extremis, that's a way you can get a tree under control quickly and then, then work with it forward from there. But generally speaking, a quarter to a third uh, of, of, an, of an old tree can be removed uh, at any given point in time. It's kind of the same general rule. Um, so look at this point also on angle of curvature, old overgrown fruit tree, you're gonna have branches actually on the ground on the outer scan, uh, outer edges of that. Make sure you're, you're prioritizing some of the removal of those at this stage also. Start getting it to go back up and out rather than out and down, okay? Now, by the time you get into your three or four, four to five potentially, you start seeing an actual tree form. And one of the things that happens as you develop a tree, talk about developing a scaffold, you've got, you've got the fingers of laterals, you kind of thin those out. But as that tree gets older and older, you might want to develop another layer up, take a branch that's got a decent angle and encourage it to go up and out and develop two or three tiers to your donut. That's what you want to be doing on an old tree at this stage is separating out into a couple of tiers of viable production wood. Um, this is mostly include will be mostly involved with removing a few individual larger older branches and then clearing up the interior again. Now you have your overall shape and you can see how this is maybe not a traditional but is a viable production tree with scaffold branches in two layer or two tiers and relatively well spaced around uh, around the, uh, the canopy. And this is just then to a maintenance pruning from here. Um, Often at this point, we will take any really, really big upper tiers out. We've got enough new growth replaced now that we can we can safely do that. A couple of uh, quick notes about that, however. Um, you, when we're talking about maintenance pruning on established fruit tree, you're talking about taking out branches from you know three quarters of an inch to a couple of inches in diameter. That's what you're taking out. When you're thinking about renovating an old tree, you might be taking out branches like this. There is a substantial risk of injury to yourself. There's a substantial risk of injury to the tree. So handle them carefully. Take them out in sections. Take a branch off and a branch off and then lop this back and then come down and cut it here. Um, trying to, to drop a six inch branch through the center of a tree with all of its lateral branches attached is a, is a no go. So avoid it. So we've gone through kind of the basics of fruit tree pruning. Um, at that point, I'd just like to open up both uh, in person and, and, uh, and at home. Uh, anybody have any questions regarding this? Yes. Could you repeat the difference between uh, the heading and the thinning cuts from an energy perspective? Sure. So the question was, uh, explain the, the difference between uh, how the tree distributes its energy after a thinning cut versus after a heading cut. So if you take a branch like this and you 
thin out an entire branch down here. The energy that's coming up here is no longer going into this branch and it's getting roughly distributed up. There'll be some emphasis down here on, these, on this lower lateral branch development, but the energy diffuses all the way up that tip. If we were to head this branch right here, the energy focuses very intensively in the two or three bud uh, clusters that are nearest the cut. So if you were thin like this, we would expect some tip coming up, but we'd also expect a little bit of additional development out here and kind of disperse down slightly more emphasized here, less and less up we go to tip. But if we cut this here, we're gonna have really substantial growth coming out of all these growing. So that's the, the, the difference in there. Yes? Either or. Uh, Probably the same question, right? Ants and earwigs. Ants and earwigs. Ants are, ants are a bit of a nuisance. Um, so I, like, do you cut away all that dead growth? Just like get rid of it? Or do you kill the insects? Yeah. So Both? ants that are actually nesting in parts of a tree are in dead wood or in cavities, potentially in damaged wood. Okay. If you've got enough habitat for ants to be living actually inside the wood, take that out. You've got a problem there, okay? Um, ants and earwigs in the furrows of the bark, normal, um, minor, minor problem usually. Mm -hmm. Young trees a little bit more, more so sometimes than older, more mature trees. Ants damage, especially peaches, nectarines, and other soft skin fruits. So do earwigs to a point. The amount of damage from earwigs to me is never worth justifying actually trying to treat for earwigs. But if you got a substantial ant population, I would try to knock it back with contact insecticides like neem. And then I would consider putting a, a, a sticky barrier. So put a cloth fabric around the trunk that stretches, so tree, tree wraps, commercial tree wraps, and put something like Tanglefoot, commercial sticky material designed as a, as a, as a trap for insects. They won't be able to climb up it. Um, so they're, you... they're in the rotting wood. Yeah, in the that's rotting wood, you take them out. You brand, prune that whole section out. That's 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 the critic. Yeah. And the earwigs that are like girdling, mm -hmm. do you just is neem enough? Oh yes. Just yeah. Take the problem is they they fly at certain stages, <laughs> so they they definitely can move around pretty right. readily. Um, I seldom have enough earwig population. To justify control, if you're seeing a lot of them, sure, uh, hit them, hit them with a contact insecticide, a one-off. Don't do it while they're flowering, obviously. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, uh, I commercially they they worry about them as a minor pest only. Um, yeah, good, good control control measures usually are a single spray. Yeah. Other uh, questions? Uh, we got a question on the chat. Okay, a couple of questions in the chat here. So. Is it okay to prune with electric or battery operated pruners rather than hand tools? I've just moved to a property with a batch of fruit trees and a lot to do. If you can justify the expense and deal with the weight issue of the battery pack, um, mechanical electrical pruners are wonderful. They use them extensively in commercial nurseries. You don't see quite as much of that being done on the commercial or orchard scale, um, mostly because you're not working around a few hundred square feet, you're working around a few acres, you're packing around some equipment, mm -hmm. but there is absolutely nothing wrong with those devices as long as you're properly caring for them. Absolutely. And another question in chat, kind of on the secondary end of the topic, remind me what the common pests for pear trees is, insecticides we use and where. So the common insect pests in pear trees are coddling moth. Same thing as apples, pears, sometimes peaches, occasionally walnuts. Codling moth has two generations per year in the Willamette Valley. There's a generation that emerges in, in May, and there's a generation that emerges in August. For apples, the May, and, and for the most part peaches, the May generation is the dominant one we're worried about because that's what's going to get into the, into the fruit. Um, codling moth is a flying insect. The eggs are laid at the base of a young fruit or at the base of a flower bud. And as that larva hatches out, it develops right down in, bores right down into the core of the fruit. And then it sits there on the interior of the fruit, eats and eats and eats, doing a very substantial amount of damage. As it hits mature, maturation, it chews its way out. It emerges from the fruit, it climbs down the tree and it pupates in the soil. 
preferred insecticides for control. Spinosad, we use Captain Jack's as a brand name, but spinosad insecticides and BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, are biological uh, insecticides that are suitable for control. Um, you can also use contact insecticides like neem and pyrethrin with reasonable success. The key with any control measure is timing. So uh, if you really are getting a problem with this and you really want to get it under control, you want to start spraying about the 1st of May. Spray every 10 to 14 days through the window of activity. So that means basically a three to four week period, usually by, uh, by, by mid, mid or mid part of June or so we're done. Um, second generation emerges usually early August here. And um, because apples are pretty well developed by that time and are also thicker in skin, we often don't see that much damage, light damage, but usually not as extensive on apples in that second generation. Pears, even though they're pretty well developed, have thin skin. They are really susceptible. Uh, in most cases, peaches are about done by that second generation or are completely done, so they don't become a problem, but then they get into the walnut husks at that point, and they get into um, prune plums, which are still on the tree at that point. So those are things you want to watch the second generation. You, besides insecticide controls, you can try, again, this band and sticky method, um, or more, more effective given the volume of insects involved, um, strap some corrugated cardboard around your tree trunk. So first generation, you're, you're done for, you got to deal with what you get. But when they emerge, they crawl down and they get into those layers of cardboard. They think they're in the soil and they try to pupate right there. And then you just take off your bands of cardboard, incinerate them or dispose of them and eliminate that generation. The problem with that is that there are lots and lots of apple and, and pear trees in the area that nobody sprays or takes any care of whatsoever. So controlling your resident codling moth population may not be sufficient for good control of your, of your fruit crop. All right, additional questions for me? Yeah. All right, well, thank you all for attending. Oh, can you just prune those the normal, like February as well? Yeah, pr 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 prunes and plums, we normally do extensive pruning uh, in the dormant cycle. They have a lot of congested interior. Now, after that dormant cycle pruning, you're gonna get a lot more of that on little wispy stuff. It's a really good idea to go in in June and do a, some very light interior opening and thinning as a follow-up pruning, but the dormant pruning is still your dominant pruning for, for plums. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, the tree that we bought was coming out at a bad angle. We bought it and did our best to get it in the ground, yeah. um, but it's continuing to go that way from, from the bowl of the tree. Is there, is there any hope to wrench that thing over and hope that it fixes himself or is that a lost us? So how long has this been going on? It's, we should have dealt with it three years ago. Okay. Because it bore back. Um, let me answer a quick question in chat. Uh, link to the recording if anyone here wants to follow up to it. Um, it will take us a few days. It will be posted to our YouTube channel. So you're welcome to review this. Um, at that point, it's going to be hard to fix. Three, four years in the ground, really hard to correct. My advice is if you got a substantial amount of lean is try Pruning. digging it okay. and resetting it. Okay. okay. It's, it's a chore at three to four years, but it's probably still doable. Now, trees will lean like that from physical responses to wind, from responses to growing towards light, especially if they get shady on this side, or from pruning problems where they didn't get enough balance going one direction and everything goes out that way. And each of those has slightly different fixes. You can try to recenter it if you can fix the problem. So if you've got a dominant wind going one way, simply staking over the over the windy periods of the fall and winter and unstaking again in the spring uh, is, is a good idea. If your problem is leaning away from shade, you're going to have to resolve that or no amount of correcting is going to fix that um, in, in that sense. Um, worth mentioning when talking about that, staking trees. Staking trees on a young tree is a very good idea. Uh, Long, make sure you don't have too much going this way, that way, what have you. But when you stake a tree, it leans on that stake system. It doesn't develop normal anchor root structure, right? So we stake them for the minimal amount of time to keep them secure in the, in the soil, to really get enough bowl that there's, their sail just doesn't blow them over enough root system to, to hold. That means we normally are trying to stake for like five to six months and then take the stakes off. Then if you start getting some lean because it's gotten it's still not strong enough, maybe stake it up for another couple of months. But as soon as you can get the stakes off, uh, the better it'll be for the tree, the better they develop angles. 
All right. Well, thank you all. You've got your coupons to spend. And for the uh, for the online attendees, there's also the online code if you want to shop online today only um, for the for the discount. Appreciate all the attendance. Thank you very much.